Stand to your feet and open up your Bible with me to Hebrew chapter 6. Hebrew chapter 6. This passage is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And I'll share with you how this passage became really personal to me last night. Okay? We're going to read together Hebrew chapter 6. We're going to read together from verse 9 to verse 20. Okay? This is what we do every time we gather. We read the Bible together. So in a count of three, yeah? We're going to read together. One, two, three. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for His name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves in all their disputes. An oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of His purpose, He guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So tonight's sermon, I'm going to title it, When God Swears an Oath. Let's pray. God, this passage that you, that we just read, that you have given us, is so beautiful. And I don't think I can do justice in explaining how amazing, how beautiful this passage is. But my prayer is that, Holy Spirit, you interpret this passage. You make it come alive. Because when this passage comes alive, Lord, we can leave this place with unshakable confidence, knowing that you are for us and you are not against us. And when we know, Jesus, that you are for us and not against us, no matter what circumstance we face in life, we will be secure because you are with us. And the only one that can translate this, make this come alive, is you, Holy Spirit. So I confess my limitation, but I also have bold confidence in your ability, Holy Spirit, to make this passage come alive. So speak to us, because what we need to hear is not the word of your sin. What we need to hear is your word, and we want to hear your word, and we're ready to hear your word. And we ask this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated. Okay, this is a question, okay? Be honest with me. Anyone ever not like your sibling? Raise your hand. Okay, if you have your sibling, you should raise your hand high and proud, okay? Because every one of us, once upon a time, we, there are times that we do not like our sibling, okay? Just put it out there. Uh, me and my sister, are, today we are BFF. We're like best friends forever. But back in the days, back in the days, we used to be enemy, okay? Back in the days, we fight all the time. And I don't know about you, whenever my, I fight with my sister, I will overwhelm her with my strength. Of course, I'm a guy, right? Okay. If I get beaten by a girl, that would be like, what? Okay. I, I will overwhelm her with my strength. But I don't know how it is in your fight with your sibling, but the loser of the fight in my fight with my sister is not who have the greatest strength, but who cried first. I don't know about you. So... In this battle, even though I overwhelm her with my strength, I always continuously lost the battle because I was always the one who cried first. Because let me tell you, because my sister has this secret weapon, and every time she uses this secret weapon, I always cry without fail, okay? This is what she always do, okay? This is what she do. So when we fight, when we, she can't overwhelm me with her strength, she will just stop, she will just look at me in the eye, and she just says this, you know what? You're not. Daddy and mommy's son. And I'm like, and he's go, don't you know? You're not actually my brother. They pick you up from the trash can. 
They feel sorry for you. That's why they take you home. You don't even look like, like them, you know? And after that, no matter what, every time she said that, the battle ends. I cried. And I'm like, Ooh. And that's every time, that's what I did. And then eventually, eventually my parents will come and my sister will get into big trouble. And this, there will come this very, very sweet moment where my dad and my mom will, you know, look at me in the eye, hug me and kisses me, embraces me and tell me like, you're my son. You're our son. You, you, we love you. We want you. Okay, it doesn't matter what your sister say. We love you. And at that time, I feel assured. I feel comforted. Even though now that I think about it, now I'm in the future, they actually never tell me that my sister was wrong in telling me, you know, maybe I was actually adopted. They just tell me, you're my son. And I'm thinking, wait, it's possible for them to adopt me. I'm t- technically still their son. Well, anyway. But, but the idea behind this passage, because this passage is given uh, by the author of Hebrew, whoever he is, in order to assure us, in order to make us know that really God wants to embrace you. God wants to look you in the eye and God wants to say, you are mine. You can find comfort in knowing that I am for you. I am your father. You belong to me. And that's the purpose of this passage. But if you remember, if you remember what happened earlier, what happened in the previous Hebrew, that's one of the hardest passages in the whole Testament. Remember what happened? The author of the book Hebrew was angry. He was rebuking the church. He said what? Do not become dull of hearing. What does it mean? You hear, but you do not hear. You hear in such a way that everything that you hear is just wasted. So you're not growing. You keep drinking milk, and while you should be eating ribeye steak now. So he said, come on. It's time to grow up. Come on. You can't keep drinking on, on milk. You need to eat rib ice steak. So now it's time to grow up. And be careful. If you do not grow up, what happened? There's a line that you must not cross. And if you cross that line, it will become impossible for you to repent. And that's a harsh word. So the book of Hebrew, the order of the book of Hebrew was rebuking the church. But now he changed. Because the purpose of rebuke is not because he was angry. No. The purpose of rebuke is because he loved them. Because he wants the church in the Hebrew, in the, the church of Hebrew, to be able to know that God is for them and not against them. And in order for them to get there, first, they have to be rebuked. You with me? So now, so now the, the point of the passage is this. You and I, every Christian, we need assurance. Because I don't know about you, I've been Christian for a while, but all my life as a Christian, I continue to struggle with sin. Until today, I'm not free from sin. So until today, even though I've been a pastor, I'm still continuing to struggle with sin. And if you're a Christian, you will know that every single day you're tempted to sin. You're tempted to do what is wrong. And every single day you have to choose to say, no, there's a struggle, there's a battle. And sometimes it makes you feel like, you know, am I really a Christian? Am I really, you know, am I really saved? Why am I still struggling with the same sin? And to those people, God want to say, you know, there's assurance for you. There's comfort in saying God is not against you. God is for you. And for those of you who are struggling, I don't know what you're struggling with. Maybe you're struggling with drug addiction. Maybe you're struggling with pornography. Maybe you're struggling with whatever it is. There's a promise for you. If you continue to trust Christ, there is assurance for you. There is comfort for you. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a church sometimes that is not really helping in this case. Because, I don't know about you, I, I heard this kind of testimony a lot. Oh, I struggled with drug addiction for 20 years. And then I met Jesus, and I, I, saved, I was saved, I'm baptized. And in one day, suddenly, I don't care about drugs anymore. Jesus is my drug, right? Okay? You heard that kind of testimony a lot, right? Like, you know, like, these kind of people where they experience the supernatural testimony where everything happens every, in, in, in a single night, and I praise, praise God for them. But most likely, that is not your story. Most likely, that is not my story. We struggle with sin. And not only we struggle with sin, maybe for some of you, God gave you a promise. God gave you a promise that you hold on to. You read the Bible and you know, this is what God says to you. And you hold on to that promise. But yet, when you hold on to that promise, you're like, when this promise will come true, God? I've been waiting for 20 years. I've been waiting for 30 years. I've been waiting for so many years. But why do I not see this promise come to fruition? And to those kind of people, tonight, the book of Hebrews says this, God want to give you assurance. You with me? So that's where we're going, okay? But before we go there, there's an, another thing that we need to talk about, okay? Because last time we talked about those who, lost, uh, who, who kind of be a kind of Christian but not Christian. But then the question today is, is how do we know? How do we know that we are still Christian? So there are two things that I want to talk about today. How do we know? How can we be sure of our salvation? That's one. And two, 
why we can be assured of our salvation. First one, how we can be assured of our salvation. In verse 9 to verse 12, this is what the Bible says. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to, earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and passions inherit the promise. Now, this is very interesting. I, I love the order of the book of Hebrew because remember, he was angry. He was rebuking the church in Hebrew. You know, I become dull of hearing. And then suddenly he turned around and said, Beloved. I love the word beloved because that's the only time the word beloved used is used in the book of Hebrew. The only time. And this is interesting because what he's trying to say is this. The reason I was angry with you, the reason I was upset with you, not because I hate you, but because I love you. How many of you heard that from your parents? You know, sometimes they say, you know, what we're going to do is actually going to hurt you. But I want to tell you beforehand, it hurt me more than it hurt you, okay? Any, any of your parents ever say that to you? Uh, that's, this is what my dad used to say before he belted me, right? He, he keeps saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discipline you, but before I discipline you, I want you to know that this hurt me more than it hurt you. And sometimes I think in my head, not in my mouth, just in my head, and I, I'm like, if it hurt you more than it hurt me, why bother? Right? Why don't you just let it go and no one need to get hurt? All right? Peace! <laughs> but anyway, he still hurt me. Uh, at that time when I was a kid, I don't, I don't really get it. But now that I'm a pastor, I get it. Because sometimes there are many times that I need to say harsh things that might sound hurtful to you. Not because I hate you, but because I love you. And that's what happened in the book Hebrew. After the rebuke, now he said, Beloved, I want you to know. And now this is what he said. I love it. But when he talked to the, uh, his audience, he says this, even though I see people losing their faith, even I see, I see people neglecting their faith, but when I look at you, church, when I look at you, the church of Hebrew, I feel assured of your salvation. Why? Because I see the fruits. I see two things in you that assure me of your salvation. What did he see? First, he sees the love for God's name. So this is the first thing that he sees. When he sees this audience, he says this, I can see that you sacrifice a lot for Jesus. I can see that you adore Jesus. I can see that you're not afraid, to, not ashamed to be called Christian, even though, remember the context? The context of the book Hebrew is the people who are persecuted for being Christian, both by the government and by their own family. And this is what he say: I can see that you're not afraid to be persecuted. You're not afraid to call yourself God follower. I can see that. But not only that, but the second thing that he says is, I see your love for one another. So not only love for God's name, but what he sees also love for one another. It's, it's evident in Hebrews chapter 10. This is what he said. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endure a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partnered with those who so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourself had a better possession and an abiding one. So this is what he said. I am sure you will be fine. I am sure of your salvation because I see two things. When I look at you, I see your love of God's name, and I see your love for one another. And Christian, this is how we know we are Christian. When you look at the fruits of your salvation, can I have the quote? You will know that you're a Christian. You and I can be assured of our salvation if we see the fruits of salvation in our life. And what is the fruit? The fruit is two things. You see the love for God and you see the love for one another. And these need to go together. Okay? You cannot have one or the other. You cannot. So you can say, I love God. I love Jesus. He's my everything. I dream about Him every single morning. But then the way you treated one another stinks. But then you being a jerk to one another, that's not acceptable. That means you do not have the fruits of salvation. Or you can be so kind toward one another. You can care about the poor. You can feed the need. You can feed the poor. You can give to the needy. You can do so many. You can sow into social justice. But if you do not do it out of your love for God's name, it is not the fruit of salvation. You with me? So what we need to see is this is a fruit of salvation. Can you see the fruits of salvation in your life? Now, I use the word fruit intentionally. What is fruit? Fruit is evidence, okay? Are you with me? Fruit is an evidence that a a tree is healthy. 
So when I use the word fruit, what I'm trying to say is this. Your fruits, the, the evidence, the way your love for God and your love for one another is the evidence that you are safe. It is not the requirement for you to be safe. So you are safe because of your faith by grace alone. But the evidence of it, it will be reflected in your love for God and your love for one another. You with me? Now, and this is interesting, okay? Now, this is interesting because he will continue and says this. There's a word, there's a phrase um, that's interesting in verse 10. says this, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work. Now, what does it mean? It does not mean this is, well, you know, I see Timmy. He's good. He loved me and he loved the girl next to him. And uh, he loved other people as well. I can see his love for the need. And because I see that, I'm going to save him. That is not what it says. Okay, some people try to interpret it that way, but that goes against that salvation is by grace through faith alone. But what this verse is saying is this. When you do everything, when you do anything for the sake of God's name, whatever sacrifice you make for one another because you love them, listen to me. God sees. God knows. God pay attention. God knows your work, and He will not overlook your work. I love it. So it goes like this. In terms of your sin, God say, I will remember your sin no more. But in terms of all the works that you do out of God, out of your love for God and one another, God say, I remember every single detail. There is not a moment that God say, oops, I forgot about it. No, He remembers and he will reward it. And the, the effect of that reward is this, that you have full assurance of hope. Now, I like the word full assurance because in Greek, it's not full. In Greek, it's the word fill up. It means this. So there's two different things, yeah? If a glass is full, it cannot be filled anymore, correct? But what the Hebrew, the order of Hebrew say is to fill up. So fill up is this, continue to be filled until it's full. So what the order of Hebrews says is you can have assurance and that assurance can continue to be filled in you until it becomes so full, until you have full confidence of hope that you belong to Jesus, okay? So it goes like this. There's five steps. I'm going to put it in step for you for type A personality. It looks like this. First step, you are safe because of your faith in Christ. That's what happened. When you put your faith in Christ at that moment, when you believe at that very moment, before you do anything of good or bad, when you put your faith in Jesus, at that very moment, you're safe. You with me? But then, out of that, out of that faith, that faith will produce love of God for love for God's name, and love for one another. It has to. A genuine faith will produce fruit. But then, when you produce that fruit, God look at that fruit and say, "Wow, amazing! I will reward you for it." I remember it, I will reward you for it. And then the fourth step is this, because now you see the fruits of your salvation and now you, f- you have assurance because of it. Now you say, oh, I can actually see the fruits in my life and I can be assured that I am a Christian. But it doesn't stop there because the author of Hebrews said that you may not become sluggish. So that's a fifth step. The fifth step goes like this. The assurance from you to produce even more fruits. You with me? So this is what happened. This is, I love the fifth point. The fifth point is a continuous cycle. So it's go like this. When you see the fruits of your salvation, you have assurance, correct? Now, when you have assurance, it prompts you to produce even more fruit. You with me? Now, when you produce more fruit, you have even more assurance. And now you have more assurance. What do you do? You produce even more fruit. That's why it's the word fill up. That's why the assurance continues to be filled up until it's full. And this is the kind of life that God wants Christians to have. That you continue to see the fruits of the salvation. You continue to have assurance. And that assurance prompts you forward to produce even more fruits. To love God even more. To love one another even more. And you have more, even more, even more, even more assurance. You with me? That's the first point. But then the question is this. Okay, yours. Okay, that's how I can be assured. But what is the foundation of my assurance? How can I know? That God will keep His part. How, do I, how can I be sure that my, this assurance is actually firm? It's not just an empty promise. How do I know why we can be assured? My second point, there are three things, okay? Three things, it's beautiful. There are three things. The first thing, the first reason why we can be assured is this, because God is faithful to keep His promise. And then He's going to give the example of Abraham. Verse 13 to 15. For when God made a promise to Abraham, 
Since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having passionately waited, obtained the promise. Now, just for the, further, uh, for the sake of clarification, do you guys know the story of Abraham? Okay, the, do you, anyone do not know the story of Abraham? Okay, you're, not, you're like, mm, should I raise my hand? Okay, just for this uh, clarity's sake, I'm going to go back and give you a little bit background of the story of Abraham, okay? It begins in Genesis 12, okay? These beautiful three verses, Genesis 12. It says, it's now the Lord said to Abraham, Grow from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonor you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, this is very interesting. So one day God came to this man by the name of Abram. His name is not Abraham yet. His name at the beginning was Abram. So Abram was a wealthy man, rich old man. And then God came to this man and said, Abraham, Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. Now, why this is interesting? Because the one thing that Abraham did not have, do you know what it is? A son, an offspring. So when God came to Abraham, God says this, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. So in order for Abraham to become a great nation, what did Abraham need to have? Offspring. Logically possible, right? I mean, you tracking with me? I mean, sorry, you with me? He need to have a son. A son is a must in order for Abraham to become a great nation. But there's a problem. Genesis chapter 11 tells us that Abraham's wife is barren. So, but somehow, Abraham, when Abraham received the promise of God, said, all right, God, I trust you. I'm going to go. So he go. He began to walk through this journey with God. And then in Genesis chapter 15, a couple of years later, Abraham still does not have a child. Sarah's still barren. So Abraham thinks, well, I'm getting old now, and I need to have an heir. I need someone to take care of my belonging. I need someone to continue my name. So what Abraham has in mind is this. Oh, I have this beautiful, wonderful servant by the name of Eliezer. He's going to be my heir. Okay? And then, and then when God show up to him, and God say, Abraham, you're great. And God say, well, I mean, Abraham say, well, God, you know, you, you promised me a son, but I'm still childless. So here, here's my solution, Eliezer. He's my servant, but he's going to be my heir. He's going to continue my lineage. And then what did God say? No, Abraham, not Eliezer. Out of you will come a son. And I love the next verses, one of the most beautiful verses in the whole Bible. So God took Abraham out of the tent. And God said, Abraham, look up in the sky. And Abraham, look up in the sky. Abraham, can you see the stars in the sky? Yes, God. Can you count them? I'm like, Come on, God. It's too many. It's impossible for me to count. And then this is what God said, Abraham, so shall your offspring be. Now think about it. Abraham does not even have a single child with me. I mean, you correct? The Abraham does not have a single child, not even one. But now God said, look at the stars. They, the number of the stars will be the number of your offspring. And that was amazing. The next line says, Abraham, believe the Lord. <laughs> I'm like, How? He does not even have one kid, but he believed the Lord that his offering will be as many as the stars. And then God says this beautiful line, and the Lord counted to him as righteousness. The moment Abraham believed in God, God says, Abraham, from this moment you're made right. You're good with me. You're safe. You're my people. You're my son. You're mine. Boom. Simply by believing. And then fast forward, Genesis chapter 16. So Abraham's still waiting. Okay, now, a few years later, come, I'm like, okay, where's the son? Where's the son? And then Abraham's wife, by the name of Sarai, come to Abraham and say, you know, did God ever tell you that um, the son will come from me? And Abraham's like, well, that's a good point. God never said it's going to come from you. It will come from you, right? Yeah, well, it come from me. I have a good solution. What is your solution? Why don't you sleep with my servant? And Abraham's like, you serious? Like, and, and Sarah's like, yeah, yeah, she's young and she's fertile. Why don't you sleep with her? And, you know, because Abram loved her, his wife so much. And I'm like, okay, baby, if you say so. So what happened is, and Ishmael was born, all right? So Ishmael was born. And, and Abram thought, this is it. Ishmael is my son. Ishmael is the answer of God's promise. Finally, I can see the fruition of God's promise. Ishmael is my son. And then 13 years later in Genesis chapter 17, so Abram thought, fine, I have Ishmael. 
God's promise is fine. Ishmael will continue God's promise. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, God show up to Abraham and say, Abraham, from today, your name will be Abraham. Why, God? Because you're going to be a father of many nations. Okay. And so now Abraham becomes father of many nations. Okay, and Abraham like, okay, that's cool. And then suddenly, suddenly, out of nowhere, God says this, Abraham, out of you will come kings and nations. And Abraham like, wow, that's cool. So out of me will come kings and nations. That is so cool. And then suddenly God drops the bomb. Boom. And what did God say? And your wife, Sarah, will be called Sarah. And I will give you a son through her. And Abram's like, ah, uh, God, I don't know if you've been paying attention, <laughs> but um, I don't know, maybe you're running other universe, other solar system, but in my solar system, it does not work anymore. I'm old. She's old. Okay? We do not function anymore. The system crashed. No way to fix it. And so it's impossible. It's humanly impossible for me to have something. My wife, no way. So God, that's not making hard for us. Ishmael. And do you know what God say? No, not Ishmael. Sarah will give birth to a son, and you will name him Isaac, which means laughter. So fast forward, fast forward again. Fast forward, finally, 25 years. After 25 years from waiting, after Genesis 12, 25 years, in Genesis 21, finally, Abraham gave birth to I mean, not Abraham, sorry. Sarah gave birth to Isaac. Isaac was born. And the moment Isaac was born, the, the, main, the name of Isaac means laughter. There's joy. There's laughter in the family. Finally, this is God's promise. After 25 years of waiting, finally, we receive God's promise. God is faithful to keep His promise. And then things happen within Sarah and Hagar. Finally, Abraham was thick. Sarah and Hagar out of the house, Ishmael out of the house. So now the only son that Abraham has is Isaac, the one and only. He no longer have Ishmael. Ishmael already left the house. And then suddenly in Genesis chapter 22, God came up to Abraham and said, Well, you know, I know, you know, Isaac is a gift from me to you. You've been waiting for 25 years, and now you're so happy. You love him so much. This is your one and only beloved son. But here's the thing. I want you to sacrifice him. And I have no idea how, but the Bible say Abram trusted the Lord. And Abram said, you know what? If you want Isaac, have Isaac. And then, this is what's beautiful. This is where I don't even want to miss. The reason, the only reason I tell you all that story is to get to this beautiful passage in Genesis chapter 22, okay? In Genesis chapter 22, so God says this. After, God, after Abraham said, have Isaac, and God said, nope, don't kill Isaac. I can see now, Abraham, that you love me more than you love your son. And then this first happened. And God, the angel of the Lord, called to Abraham second time from heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not, have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. God swear by himself. Okay? So let's go back to the book of Hebrew now. So what can we learn from here? Simply this. Remember, God is faithful to keep his promises. Even though Abraham had to wait 25 years, and even though along the way, Abraham failed again and again and again and again. Abraham will make a lot of mistakes. Abraham keep offering different solutions. Eliezer, Ishmael, Abraham even lied about his own wife. Abraham failed and again and again. But the beautiful thing about the promise of God is this. The promise of God does not depend on Abraham's faithfulness to God. The promise of God depends on God's faithfulness to Abraham. God is faithful to keep His promise. And Abraham received the promise through what? Through faith and passions. As he waited, and God said, you know what? I keep my word. I give you my promise your son, you will inherit. And then God swore, which leads us to the second thing. How can, why we can be assured? First, we can be assured because God is faithful to keep his promises. Second, because God swore an oath. And this is beautiful, beautiful verses. Six, six, verse 16 to verse 18, 18. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their dispute, an oath is final for confirmation. 
So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Now, okay? This verse is massive, so we're going to digest it slowly. We're going to chew it slowly. But before we jump to this passage, I need you to understand something first. Remember, God is faithful to keep His promise. You with me? Remember this. If God is God, that means He can do whatever He wants, however He wants, whenever He wants. When God speaks, it happens. The book of Genesis says this. In the beginning, there was nothing. And the moment God speaks, everything came to be. So God does not need anyone else to fulfill His promise. This is different from you and me. If I make a promise to you that today's sermon will be short, all I can say is, I will try my best. There will be no certainty that the sermon will be short. But when God makes a promise that His sermon will be short, you can be assured. Well, but one day in the eyes of the Lord is 1,000 years for us, so you never know. But when God will make a promise, when God says something, you can be assured it will happen. Because the Word of God has power to create everything into existence out of nothing. He does not need you. He does not need me. He just needs to say it. It will come to pass. His promise is sure. And if that all God gave us, that's enough. If all God gave us is promise, that's enough. We can trust Him. We can trust His promise. But then God raised the stake. He not only promised Abraham, he swore an oath, okay? Now, this is beautiful, okay? I need you to read it slowly with me, okay? Starting from verse 17. So when, who desire? God desire. Who desire? It's not a tricky question. Who desire? God. So it means this. It is God's initiative. It is something that God wants to do. It is God's desire. No one forced him. No, this is something that God initiated on his own. This is something that God wants to do. What does he want to do? When God desired to show more convincingly to the heir of the promise. Who's the heir of the promise? That's you and me. Because we are adopted heir. The heir of the promise do not belong to Israel only, but the heir of the promise, they belong to you and me, Christian. We are the heir of the promise of God. So now he says, so when God desire, when God wants to show something to you and me, what, what he wants to show? The unchangeable character of his purpose. What does that mean? He wants to show this, that you can trust him, that he does not change his mind about you, that no matter what, that he's so convinced about you, that there will not be a day where God says, you know what, I think I make a, diff- a wrong choice in choosing Timmy. I think I make a wrong choice in choosing you. See, I should have picked better. No, that day will never come because God never changed. So in order for him to show you and me that we can trust him, that we have assurance in Him, that we can be assured of our salvation in order to convince you and me. What did God do? God make an oath. God swear an oath. Now, when we swear, we never swear on something that is less than us. Correct? When I swear, I do not say, I swear on my cat. Because one, I do not have a cat. Two, who cares about a cat, right? So when we swear, we swear on something bigger than us, okay? The most popular one in Western countries is, I swear on my mother's grave. What does it mean? It means this. If I lie to you, may my mother's grave be cursed. You with me? That's the idea when we swear. When I swear by something, so it says this. So if what I say do not come true, if I'm lying to you, may that very thing that I swear on be cursed. So when God wants to swear, he finds a dilemma. What is God's dilemma? He needs to find something greater than himself, right? So now God thinks, well, what should I swear on? Uh, should I swear on heaven? Well, I created heaven. Should I swear on Gabriel, his cool well, archangel, Michael? Well, I created them. Should I swear on Yossi? Oh, definitely no. Well, what should I swear on? And then finally God thinks, oh, I know. What is the most valuable thing? Being, what is the most precious being in the universe? What is the most valuable, even when all the universe combined together is not as valuable as this thing? Oh, I know. Me, myself. Let me swear upon myself. Do you know what it means? It means this. When God swears by himself, he says this. If what I say to you 
do not come to pass. Let me be cursed. Let me die. Now, can you imagine that? A God of the universe swearing an oath to you. He swear an oath to you. Why? What's the purpose of that? So, so then I'll continue. So that by two unchangeable things. What is the unchangeable thing? First, that God is faithful to His promises. That God always keeps His word. His word is unchangeable. His word is powerful. That's the first one. God does not need anyone to help Him. He always keeps His word. That's the first thing. And the second unchangeable thing is what? God keep. God swear an oath, which He put on Himself. So that by two unchangeable things, what happened? It is impossible for God to lie. Now, God comes to a position that it is impossible for Him to lie. Because one, He gives you His promise, His word. Two, He swear an oath. Why? So now the question would be this. Why? Why would God swear an oath? Why would God do that? Why does God need to put Himself on the line? So this is beautiful. says this. So that, no, 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 not yet, not yet. Not. So we have who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope He set before us. I love it. So this is what God's saying. In order for you and me, in order for the church of God, in order for the people of God, might have strong encouragement. God say, I will swear upon my own name. I love the way John Piper put it. John Piper put it this way. So God was thinking in His head, what is the strongest encouragement I can give to Rock Sydney International? What if the strongest encouragement I can give to Pastor Sam? What is the strongest encouragement I can give to Yossi, to Timmy, to Will, to everyone else, to every person that trusts me that I will not lie to them? What is the strongest encouragement I can give them? I know. I'm going to swear upon my own name. So now it is impossible for me to lie. And listen, just listen. The only way God can break His oath to us the only way God can break His oath to Rock Sydney International, the only way God can break His oath to the heir of promise is one thing. If God stop being God, translation, that day never exists. That day will never ever come. God will always be God. That means this, as long as God is God, His word is trustworthy. His promise is sure. You can trust Him. I can trust Him. He will not fail. He's a promise-keeping God. Okay, I'm, I don't know, I'm so excited. Some of you are like, woo. But I'm really, really, my heart's really yearn for you guys. I need you to understand that the re- only reason God put Himself on the line is this, so that you and I might have the strongest encouragement in trusting Him. So that when you and I are in the midst of the storm, we flee to Him for refuge. Not anyone else. Him. That's why he swore an oath by himself. And if that's, just, if that's all God gave us, I'd be happy. I'd be like, oh my gosh, I just want to sing, raise my hand and sing Anchor, which we ended up not singing after this. But um, I just want to say, Lord, you are the unchangeable. You are my God. I just want to love you. I just want to raise my hand. I just want to worship you. You're just so amazing. You're just so good. I just want to just declare that you are my all in all. Just amazing, God. But yet, God is not finished. Even after He said, I am faithful to keep my promise, I swear an oath to you, God continue another step. He take another step. And the third thing that we have, why we can be assured is this, we have an upside down anchor. This is the verses. In verse 19, 20. We have this as sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enter into the inner place behind the curtain. Where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, let me explain. Um, Do you know what's the purpose of an anchor? Uh, The purpose of an anchor is to make sure a boat remains steady in in the midst of the sea. You with me? That's the purpose of the anchor, okay? A couple of months ago, um, me and a couple of friends from Rock City International, um, we decided to go... um, have fellowship on a boat. So when they invited me, like, oh, do you want to you wanna go on a fellowship on a boat with us? I'm like, yeah! But I don't know why. What comes to my mind was not a boat. What comes to my mind was a yak, right? And you know, there's a big difference between yak and a boat. <laughs> so I was ready for, you know, sunbathing with my sunnies, you know, in yak, you know, laying down, fun, having fun. And when I get to the place, I'm like, okay. 
Never again. Okay? So, so anyway, so we decided to go this, um, have fellowship on this boat. So we, deci- we went. So we, we drive to some places that we, c- we can stop. And so when we find a nice place for us to just, get, just stick around, just to have fellowship, uh, we let the anchor down. And the purpose of the let, uh, letting the anchor down is so that the boat will be steady. And then, but for whatever reason, we found out that the boat is keep moving. Okay? Why is the boat keep moving? So we pull out the anchor, and then we throw down the anchor again. Why? Because you know, biologically speaking, in order for an anchor to work, two things must happen. First, the anchor must be attached to the boat. Correct? But another thing, not only the anchor must be attached to the boat, but the other end of the anchor must be attached to something firm and permanent that is strong enough to hold the weight of the boat. You with me? If the other end of the anchor is not attached to something firm and permanent, then there's no purpose of the anchor. And this is what the author of Hebrews say. Do you know that you and I as a creation, our soul have an anchor? And our anchor is not attached to something down there. Our anchor is attached to something high in the heaven. It's not a normal anchor. It's an upside down anchor. And not only that, he says this, but our anchor is a hope. What kind of hope? A hope that have entered into God's presence. A hope that have entered into the inner chamber. That's an Old Testament language, which means this. That things means this. There's only one person that can enter the inner chamber. He's the high priest of Israel, where he once a year will make sacrifice on behalf of this Israel in order for God to have to forgive the sin of Israel, to make peace between God and Israel. So now that the, the high priest already entered um, the inner chamber and makes sacrifices, there's peace between God and man. And now this is what the author of Hebrews is saying. You and I have an anchor. And our anchor is a hope that have entered into inner chamber. And our anchor has a name. What is the name of our anchor? Jesus. So now the logic is, he says this. Jesus is not like any other priest. Jesus is the priest after the order of Melchizedek, which we're going to talk about next week. The order of Melchizedek, what does it mean? It means that Jesus is an eternal priest. Jesus is Never changing priest. He does not need to be replaced. Once he's in the inner chamber, he stays there forever. So this is my anchor. This is your anchor. That when Jesus died, he remained in the inner chamber. When Jesus entered into the presence of God, he remained there forever. What does he do? He prayed for us. He prayed for us. He's interceding for us. And that, if Jesus prayed for you and me, my question is this. Can Jesus fail? No. Jesus cannot fail. Because of that, he says this, our hope is not a mere wish. Our hope is a sure and steadfast anchor. Jesus is the anchor of our soul. So if you understand this, there are three things that why we can be sure. First, God is always faithful to keep his promises. Two, he swear an oath. And three, we have an anchor, upside down anchor. And his name is Jesus. You can come back, Lord. Let me close with application. And before I go to application, let me share with you how this passage really speaks to me. Because this passage is not only a seasonal passage. This passage is something that we need to cling on to every day. Because I mentioned earlier in the beginning of the sermon, every day we are tempted. Every day we are tempted. You are struggling with sin. We are tempted to live our faith. We are tempted to leave our faith and pursue everything else but Jesus. We continue to ask the question, God, will, when will your promise come true? God, I know you promised me, but how can I not see the fruition of your promise? God, I've been waiting for 10 years. I've been waiting for 6 years. I've been waiting for 5 years. God, I've been waiting for 20 years, but why do I not see the, your promise come to fruition? God, why? And that's the struggle that we will face every single day as Christians. And that is a struggle that we, I will face as well as a Christian. Yesterday, um, I had a panic attack at night. Um, I don't know why. Like, well, I know why. Because during the day, uh, if you do not know, uh, we spend five and a half hours between the IRSA leaders. We're talking, uh, meeting about, you know, how can we serve Roxanne International better in the next coming three months, six months. So we have five and a half hours of meeting. That's long, okay? That's a very long meeting. 
five and a half hours. And, you know, during the meeting, I was fine. During the meeting, you know, I was bold. You know, I tell, you know, you know the good thing about the young leaders, they're crazy. So whatever you say, yes, we do. So I'm crazy, so we're crazy together. The things that we want to do in the next coming years, in the next coming months, it's logically speaking, not wise. Because logically speaking, humanly speaking, there are many better ways to do things than the way that we want to do it. But I'm just convinced that this is what God wants us to do and this is where God leads us. And I share with them. And when I was sharing with them, I was totally convinced. This is it. This is the way to go. This is where we're going to go as a church, as Roxy International. Okay? I was confident. But when I went home at night, um, I think about 9.30, I have no idea. Suddenly, I have a panic attack. Suddenly, I become extremely anxious. I don't understand why. I become extremely worried. I became like, Lord, I don't know. It's just like, I feel like I don't have confidence to move forward with everything that we just talked about for the past five and a half hours. I feel like maybe it's a mistake. It's like, ugh. I know it's not a mistake. I know this is what the Bible says, but I, I'm afraid. I'm, actually, I'm really, really anxious. And my heart be like, do, 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 do. If, you, if you ever have an anxious attack, anxiety attack, you know. My heart be like, do, 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 do. And I'm oh, no, 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 no. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? So I close my eye, turn off my light, and I try to pray. What's, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What is wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And then God reminded me, anchor, anchor, anchor. What does it mean, anchor? So I keep listening to a song that I thought we were going to sing after the service, but we're not. So I, I listened to this song called Anchor by Hillsong. So I keep listening to this anchor. I keep singing to anchor for one hour. I keep listening. I keep praying. I keep listening. I keep praying. I keep listening. I keep praying. And finally, I realized what God is saying. Sometime, sometime, me as a preacher, I know how to speak. I know how to preach. But sometimes I don't know how to apply. And when I'm reminded of that, I look at my notes, my sermon notes that I prepared for you guys. And there's three applications. What should we do in the midst of our sentence? When we wait for God's promises, when we're struggling with sin, when we say, we know, I know this is what's the right thing to do, but God, I, 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 I know, I don't, I don't, I'm just afraid, Lord. I don't know if this is the right step, Lord. I know it's the right step because your word says so, but I don't know if I have the courage to do it. And when you're in the midst of that anxiety, when you're anxious waiting for God's promise, there are three applications. One, look to the, at the anchor. Because when you look at the anchor, this is what you find. When you look at the anchor, you'll find, first of all, God who swore an oath to you. You find God who kept His promise to Abraham. Abraham waited for 25 years. And Abraham messed up again and again. But yet God continued to be faithful and deliver His promise. And if God is faithful to Abraham, He will be faithful to you and me. And He swore an oath. And do you know what, co- what, what caused God to keep His oath to you? His son. In order for him to keep his oath to you, he has to sacrifice his son. Jesus has to come and die in order for us to become the heir of promise. And God can say to you and me, I am for you and not against you. You can trust me. Look at the anchor. And not enough. You're not Looking at the anchor alone is not enough. The second thing that you need to do is this. You need to trust the anchor. Because it's when you, if you just look at the anchor but you don't put your trust in it, that it has no point. But when, when the book of Romans says this, if God did not spare His own Son but willingly give Him up for us all, how can He, will, how will not, how can he withheld anything good from you? It means this, if Jesus already come and Jesus already died for you, God gave Jesus in order to keep His promise to you, in order to keep His oath to you, how can you not trust the anchor? It does not mean, it does not mean that means your life will be smooth. No, it does not mean that. It means it's when life, storm come, the anchor will make sure you remain steady. You can trust Him. Jesus is praying for you. Even right now, 365 days a year, 25, 24 hours a day. Wait, 24 hours a day. Yeah, that's right. 60 hours or 60 minutes per hour. There you go. Whatever. Not even one second. Not a single millisecond where Jesus do not pray for you. And if that's the case, you can trust the anchor. And not only that, the last thing, you not only trust the anchor, but the encouragement is hold fast to the anchor. Because God says, I give you the strongest encouragement. 
I give you every reason to not doubt me, even to the point that I swear an oath and give my son. I'm holding fast to you. And when you know God holds fast to you, you can hold fast to him. It is not, it is not, God has done his part. No, you do your part. No, it is God has done his part and he empower you to do your part. So now, church, Roxy International, hold fast to your anchor. Hold fast to Jesus. He will not fail you. Let's pray. God, I pray that tonight I don't know what circumstances we're facing in life. I don't know what promises are we waiting for. I don't know what struggle that we're facing. But one thing that I do know, one thing that I do know, you will never ever abandon us. So I pray, God, uh, for your people, for myself, as we continue to waver, continue to doubt, continue to question. Maybe for some of us, we've been waiting for that promise for many, many years, Lord. And, and uh, the thing that we've been waiting for is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's, and in fact, we can look at the Bible and it seems like the Bible promises that very thing. Just like Abraham, that promise seems to never, never come to fruition. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you help us, God. I pray that you enable us to trust you, Jesus. If you do not spare your own son in order to keep your oath to us, If you give heaven's very best in order to keep your word to Abraham and to us, the heir of promise, help us to trust you. Remind our soul that we have an anchor, sure and steadfast hope that has entered into the presence of God and continue to pray for us today. And this anchor will not fail us even in the greatest storm, even in the longest seasons of waiting, you remain there. And I pray that tonight, Lord, that we find steadiness in you, Jesus. Help us to look to you. Teach us, God, because we cannot do it without you. But yet, you have given us the strongest encouragement. Thank you for holding fast to us, Lord. And now enable us to hold fast to you. We trust you. We love you. We adore you. And we worship you. Jesus, you are the anchor of our soul. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as we worship.